Warning. The following podcast contains graphic content that may be disturbing or triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. The Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is available free of charge thanks to the support of Cracked Armor. Their mission is to raise awareness for PTSD, TBI, and mental health to support those who struggle. By creating an army of warriors who represent the gear, their hope is that it will send a message to others that they are not alone. Go to crackedarmor.com. Say hi to Mark Long, read about the story, and find some research information about PTSD. And if you can, look good while supporting Cracked Armor by buying some gear. Ten nine. Did you say Papa Tango Sierra Delta? There's so much left to do, so many things I want to see and I see. Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away. This is episode 18 of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton, and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress. Before I start off the intro today, I'd just like to give a shout out to listeners in Finland, New Zealand, and Australia. Thank you very much for tuning in regularly. I see that, and I sincerely appreciate that. I want to take a moment today to just talk about my extreme gratitude to the members of the Halifax Regional Fire Department, as well as volunteer firefighters, the Department of Natural Resources, and firefighters from outside areas that have come in to assist with the wildfire that broke out in Tantala and Hammonds Plains area on May 28th. We were shocked, and I say shocked because I just couldn't conceive that it was actually happening here like that. I live in Waverly, which is about a 20, 25 minute drive to that area. Now it's a lot closer than that as the crow flies. And on Sunday, the wind was blowing out of the south, which was pushing the fire our way and the smoke just overhead. You could smell the fresh burning fire as if you had a little camp out in your backyard. It was that present. By the nighttime, my neighbor was reporting seeing ash falling on his property. My family and I started to prepare for a possible evacuation. It's the first time I've ever had to do that in my life, and it is not a very fucking nice feeling. Trying to make notes of everything you need, trying to gather up stuff that will get you by for the next little while, those mementos that are just super fucking important, things that you really don't want to miss, and then accepting that there's a lot of things that you don't want to miss that you unfortunately will have to, that you just can't take with you. You can't pack up your entire fucking house and go. Yeah, it was odd. Walking around the outside of my house, walking through my house with my phone, taking video of everything and talking my way through in case I needed it for insurance purposes. Staying up all evening, listening to alerts that were coming through. There were so many sirens and alerts that day that when I was laying in bed, and it was probably about 100 hours, I could hear sirens and alerts going. Although my brain knew they weren't happening, but I could hear them. Those fucking sounds are just seared into my head. And hearing them so much that day just fucking brought out so many shitty memories. Now, I'm well aware that for us to have any opportunity to prepare evacuation is just pure, I don't know, luck, maybe. I don't know what it is, but I'm very fucking gracious that we did have that time to be able to prepare. There's a lot of people in that area, a lot of people in that area that did not have that time, that did not get to go home to save their pets. They were out for a beautiful Sunday afternoon and it was gorgeous. It was the nicest day we've had yet this year. Warm, sunny, 
not a cloud in the sky. It was beautiful. And then all of a sudden this broke out and shit just changed very quickly. It's unknown yet how many pets have died. Although there's been a number of them, there's no doubt. There were horses that were let loose out of their stables because there was no way to get them out. There was a lady who actually apparently ran 3K back in through the wooded areas during the fire in order to save 18 dogs that she had at her kennel slash inn for when people are gone away on vacation. She saved them all. Luckily, there's been no reports of any person that has been hurt, which is absolutely and utterly amazing. And it speaks volumes to the work done by those in the emergency management system that were taking care of things that day. That fire spread violently fast violently fast and it was fucking pretty scary pretty scary as of today and i'm recording this on the 30th of may they're estimating there's over 200 homes that have either been damaged or completely leveled there's approximately 16,000 people that were forced out of the evacuation area and it's still out of control the wind switched which is blowing things back towards our way today and the smell has completely changed. Sunday, as I said, fresh wood. Again, very akin to a campfire. Today, completely different. Much more like the smells that remind me of times I was on the job and went to house fires, structure fires. Completely different smell of that burn. And it's strong here. It's strong today. It's blowing it right our way again. Well, I pray that they can keep it at bay. They can keep it under control. They can prevent any more animals from losing their lives, any more houses from being destroyed, any more houses being damaged, and anyone being hurt, including our brave firefighters and natural resources members, as well as police that have been out there. There's been a lot of police on those roads, directing traffic, trying to ensure the evacs are done. Appreciate the RCMP's work out there, and I'm sure HRP has helped as well. So I just want to take a moment on this to say, yeah, thank you very much to everyone out there that's been working on this fire. And it was a huge wake up call as to how fucking fast this can happen and how fast that fire can travel and how much destruction it can do. Unbelievable. And as I mentioned, it brings back some shitty memories. Well, I'm not going to talk about those today because in all honesty, I truly don't give a fuck about myself today with regards to how much is being done to try and keep the public safe. Great work, guys and girls. I appreciate it. All my brothers and sisters, I so much, so much appreciate it. The last thing I'll say before we take a break is we all have a to-do list, like a things to do list, like just shit that you need to do all the time. We all do. Whether it's on your phone, whether you write it on paper, whether it's in your head, Whatever. You have a fucking list of things to do. I want us all to start working on a stop doing list. Exactly. Exactly like you just heard. Literally, a stop doing list. A list of things that you need to stop doing. That could very much be watching the news. Because it fucking enrages you. Or it brings back bad memories. Or it brings back emotions and makes you cry. It puts you in a shitty place. Because let's be honest. I mean, let's be honest. When the fuck is the news ever a happy thing to watch? It's not. I mean, they'll sometimes have that fucking one or two stories on there that's like, oh, that makes me feel nice. That was nice that that person did that. But generally, it's always bad news. It's the shits. So that could be something that's on your stop doing list. Stop watching the fucking news. It could be something as simple as stop reading a particular thing. Stop doing a particular thing in the morning. Stop yourself when those shitty memories start creeping in. Stop doing things. So let's work on a stop doing list. Own your no's, protect your yeses. We'll focus on things that we just need to stop doing and really work on getting out of our own way and stop doing it. Stop bringing ourselves down that shitty fucking path. Let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you have experience with post-traumatic stress and would like to join me for an episode, please reach out to me. 
You can contact me via direct message on Instagram, PTSD underscore podcast, or you can send me an email at Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast at gmail.com. Cheers. We are back from the break. Thank you very much for staying tuned in to the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. I'd like to give a warm welcome to retired RCMP civilian member, Sinead Holstein, who was with the Southern Alberta Operational Communications Center. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Dispatch is often something that is well underappreciated, embarrassingly forgotten in terms of the amount of scarring that it can leave and that you're part of this as well. So Sinead, please introduce yourself and tell us about your journey. I'm Sinead Holstein, as you mentioned. I was a civilian member with the RCMP for 16 years. Today marks my first month of medical retirement from the force. And it's been an interesting and hard month, to say the least. I've done my whole career with SCOCC, Southern Alberta Operational Communication Center. Basically what my center it, it's changed a little bit now, but from when I started to basically when I left, uh, we dispatched for all of Central and Southern Alberta, just south of like the Millet Overpass, south of Edmonton, all the way to the Montana border, and then from BC to Saskatchewan border. And in that, we also dispatched for traffic sheriffs. That also since changed, but that was a good chunk of my career. And what that looks like is we take 911 calls for police only. For all those areas that are policed by RCMP, and we also take non-emergency complaint line calls. When I started, we used to do call taking and dispatching at the same time. So you would take your call, you would create your file, and then you would be the one to dispatch that to your officers that you were responsible for in the area. A few years ago now, gosh, like a very many years ago, that changed and it turned into split call taking and dispatching. And that was a really hard adjustment, but in the end, it's been a blessing, I'd like to say. When there's enough staff, it's a blessing. Just being able to focus on the caller and give them your undivided attention when they're in crisis is really, really important. It helps build a relationship with them very quickly to get the information you need to keep them and the officers safe in critical incidents. And then also with the amount of officers and area that you dispatch for, It's just really good to be able to focus on that and you know what's going on in your areas. So as a dispatcher, you're assigned areas of the province and that can be anywhere from three detachments to 15 or plus, depending on the time of night and what area of the province they're in. And you're responsible for every officer. That's a lot. That's a lot. It can be. Yeah. And sometimes it's really great because there's not a lot going on. And then other days you're just balls to the walls and you don't know what's happening and you just hang on by the seat of your pants. Scary. It can be. Uh, You know, as a person who, so, I mean, although I was in Hanna Detachment in Alberta and K Division before you had joined the SAOCC, still, I recognize that is exactly where my calls would come from. These would be the dispatchers, the communications operators that I was speaking with during some absolutely terrifying times of my own. And again, you're in ahead of the game a lot of times trying to deal with calls from clients, from victims, from all over Southern Alberta. You, like you said, you could have up to 15 detachment areas. I mean, that's massive. I know, you know, my father being a Royal Newfoundland Constabulary member when he came out to handle the first time and we just drove the border of the detachment area that I was responsible for working alone, it blew his mind. He couldn't believe the size of it and what the expectations were. And now we go back to you as an OCC communications operator, and you have 15 of these places. And that's a ballpark. Like, it fluctuates so often, and it really depends on how many people we have working. Right. Um, Some nights in the middle of winter, you know, night shifts between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., there could be two or three for SAOCC dispatchers. Um, You also have to take into consideration break times or having to run to the washroom. And there's so much teamwork involved to keep the place running smoothly is, okay, so you have two dispatchers at that time, but if you have to leave to go to the bathroom, that person will take your responsibilities 
And then it's that one person and you hurry and you come back, but that's the, the nature of the job. And typically our supervisors and our management is really good at looking at statistics and calls and, and call volumes around times and trying to staff when the busy times are, but it can be a random Tuesday at 3.30 a.m. in the middle of winter at minus 50 and shit hits the fan. And you can't predict and you can't staff for that. So you just do the best you can. And we're highly trained and have a ton of resources at our fingertips that we can use to keep everyone safe, which is so comforting and knowing that, yes, it might sound like a lot and overwhelming, but knowing that we're never alone in our seat makes it just a little bit easier. Well, as someone who was out there working, and for brothers and sisters that I know who have been out there working during your watch, I really do appreciate your service and taking care of everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. It's definitely when I started the force and like ROCC has changed for the better, the mentality around mental health and stuff. I got diagnosed with PTSD um, probably two years ago. And in all honesty, it came as a surprise for me at the time that I had that. I was living my life just with blinders on, thinking that everything was okay. And I was watching TikTok, and I, I, I'm sure that there's many listeners rolling their eyes now, but it started coming up about ADHD and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I really relate to that. I reached out to a counselor just in the community to see if I could get a diagnosis for that. And we get halfway through, and he stops me, and he says, no, Sinead, like I, you might have ADHD, but at this point, you have PTSD, and you need to go see someone. And talk to someone about that. He's like, I don't have the qualifications to help you with what you need. And I, I just kind of was like, well, like, what do you know? Wow. I mean, right? Like, how can you say that when we've talked for 20 minutes and, and I'm okay? I've lived my entire life, my entire career of being not okay, but kind of just denying that I wasn't okay. Sure. Yeah. And luckily there's a operator that I've worked with for many years who's just she at the time was screaming from the rooftop about her PTSD diagnosis and she's super approachable and really knowledgeable. And I kind of took a step back. I'm like, you know, maybe there's something here. So I reached out to her. I'm like, okay, so this is what happened. Now what? And she sent me messages just with who to see and what to do and how to work through back and I'm um, sorry, veterans affairs and, and all this stuff and like what that looked like. And honestly, without her, and her guidance and her pushing me in a positive way, I probably would have just sat on that diagnosis or that suggestion from the therapist and been like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Like that might be a thing, but I'm dealing with it. Okay. Looking back, I wasn't okay for a long time and I had no idea. And I don't know if people in my life didn't know, or they just were scared to mention it. Like I'm married. I have two kids. I've been married for 11 years. And I look back, I'm like, well, I mean, that must have been so hard on my husband and like my kids wouldn't know any different, but now what? Absolutely. I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank God that she was there to help because I mean, I would, I don't know if it wasn't for my wife, I, this podcast wouldn't exist because I still wouldn't have gone and talked to anybody. Well, and that's just it. Like we stand on the shoulders of the people that came before us and the fact that she was so brave and so articulate and so in your face in a good way about her struggles, it made it easier, which is why like podcasts like yours are so important, you know, because you have so many people that don't know they have it or that just it's not something that could happen to me. When I started my career in 2007, our management was very different and the mentality around PTSD was very, very different. And I remember starting and my boss at the time says, you can't get PTSD as a dispatcher because you don't see anything. That's only what police officers can, they can, they're the only ones that can get it. And uh, the absurdity uh, of that is... <laughs> right. And I'm 22 and I went to college for policing. So like in my head, I'm like, okay, like, cool. I'm immune to this because my position isn't as important or isn't as directly influenced by trauma as a police officer on the front lines who sees the things and smells the things. And it's funny as I get older and as I look into this, two things can exist in the same place and two people can have different experiences on each side of the coin and still come out with similar outcomes and trauma from that. So yeah, okay, so at a car accident where a child is thrown, like I take that call and I deal with that with EMS and fire and sometimes witnesses and all of that. I don't go and I don't smell it. I don't smell the blood. I don't have to literally pick up the pieces. But then I'm also the one that deals with the witnesses, constantly hangs up. 
and either has to deal with the family calling in like, oh, I heard or reporting an overdue traveler, or even just taking a call right after that, like something major, taking a call of a barking dog. And it's not to downplay the barking dog because in that moment, that's that person's crisis. But I literally just had to take a call of a dead child on the road from a witness driving by or someone who's involved and injured. And now I have to kind of dial it back and be like empathetic for this person at three in the morning who's still awake or their kids are awake with a barking dog. That's, That's tough. really, yeah. it can be really challenging to kind of like roll in your empathy and like really play into it because it's not the person that's calling about the barking dog fault that I just dealt with that and I didn't take a break or I didn't take a breath or I didn't have time. And so to take it out on them just really isn't fair. The reality of it is though, and I will tell you from the police officer side, when someone says to you that you are immune from this, you can't experience it because you do not see what they saw. I will tell you that of all the things that I've seen, the two senses that are still affected the most and have the biggest impact on me are my sense of smell and hearing. Those are things, seeing, I don't know, you see all kinds of horrible things all the time and we almost have some sort of a strange, I won't say immunity from it, but I mean, again, we're used to just seeing shit on TV that over the years, it just seems to be gotten more and more vivid, I guess. And so, you know, again, seeing things is horrible, but touching them is brutal. However, smelling and hearing, hearing the screams, hearing the gurgles of death, hearing the pleas for help, that's scarring. And the difference between someone like you and someone like me is that I'm at least there and can try to do something about it. Whereas you're there and just trying to use your voice in a situation that you have no concept of seeing or smelling or feeling, you're just trying to do everything on hearing. And that's obviously going to leave such a huge scar. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, something I've learned over the years is how I envision something in my head that's happening is usually way worse than what it actually looks like on the scene. So I'll see pictures or something and it'll be an NBC, for example. And in my brain, it's just this mangled mess and there's nothing left of a car. And in reality, I'll see pictures and I'll be like, oh, that looks like just the front end's missing. How in the world did four people die in that? But my brain, when I'm taking that call or sending officers or traffic analysts or all that stuff that we coordinate, my head tells me that it's just massive and it's always catastrophic. And in reality, that's not necessarily what it looks like. And it does help to see pictures or to see kind of what actually happened because it takes away the imagination part of it. And as creatures of creativity, our imagination is so strong and it always goes worst case scenario, especially in first responders. Absolutely. I mean, and that's an old Hitchcock trick. I mean, Hitchcock would never show you the scary thing in the movie until the very end because whatever your mind created was worse than he could ever create on screen. Well, exactly. So it takes time as far as not knowing the calls or the end of the calls. It got to a point where we were just so steady at work that I really didn't think of the calls after just kind of work through. Or if I was curious, I'd ask the officers or even just read the newspaper and taking into account that things aren't always straightforward that way. But just kind of getting an idea or giggling because like knowing what happened and seeing what's printed is, can sometimes be very different. Yeah. It's almost cute, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Right? Oh. Yeah, okay. That's not what it was like, but oh. <laughs> you tried. So it's been okay. I think it took a lot of time to kind of get the realization that I won't read the end of the book. As you said, like it, it's just, it was what it was. I don't need an end. Like, I don't need an ending. And something that surprised me as I kind of went on with my career is calls that I would take that I felt should have been traumatic weren't for me, that they just kind of existed. I dealt with them and moved on. And then there's other calls that just seemed so minute and just almost uneventful that would stick with me for a couple of days. I could think about them and, and I realized that, oh, that actually affected me in a way that I didn't expect. And I think part of that goes to personal expectations around trauma and PTSD. In order to feel trauma or have PTSD or whatever that looks like for a person, it has to be something big and meaningful and like just this giant thing. And that's not always the case. Sometimes it's how you relate to the person that you were talking to or 
something that happened can trigger a memory that you don't even know exists and that somehow gets through your armor. And I always would tell new operators before I left was, don't be upset or don't be sad if something comes through and it affects you in a way that you didn't expect. Don't feel disappointed in yourself, but be mindful of those things. If there's a call that you're thinking about two or three days after you took it, that's something that's going to stick with you. And you should really talk to someone about it now instead of 10 or 15 years down the road when you have 17 of those same calls that affected you in whatever way that now it's beyond your scope of tools that you have and you possess. It's such a challenge working for as long as I did because our management changed. About 2014, I was on that leave and I came back and we had a new manager and everything. And I can't say how much it felt like a breath of fresh air to have someone as amazing as our commander now. He came in and was supportive of so much stuff and mental health and It was such a contrast from having someone tell me that I can't go to debriefings for some things I've done because I'm just an operator and it shouldn't affect me. Or I remember I'd been talking to a therapist just kind of on and off my adult life. And she mentioned in my first part of my career that like, we're talking probably two years in, she was like, yeah, you know, you might have PTSD or like, this might be something to look into. And I totally brushed it off as you do. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a coworker and I mentioned, you know, like the therapist said this and I just, I don't think so. Like, it's really not a thing. And she looks me dead in the eye and she says, Sinead, whatever you do, don't tell anyone at work because it will ruin your career. Yeah. Right. And it, that didn't come from a place of her being malicious or like judgmental. Nope. She was stating a fact that if I came, especially being a new operator, like, It was sink or swim, and there wasn't as much support as there is now, and it was really a tough environment to thrive in, and a lot of people didn't. And there was almost this, well, if you can't cut it, then you're not as good as me attitude. And that's since changed. Our job isn't for everyone, and you don't know it's not for you until you take your first traumatic call or the call of someone screaming so loud that you can't understand. Really, you don't know that whether you can handle that or not until you're in it. And you can train all you want, but you just don't know. And now the attitude is like, that's so great that you realize this isn't for you now, as opposed to 17 years down the road, 15 years down the road, when you can't cut it. So the attitude changing for the better as far as people realizing that they're not in a place to take those calls or do the job and admiration almost for realizing early on that you can't do that. That wasn't something that we dealt with. That that wasn't the approach many, many years ago. It was, well, you're not good enough to be here. You're not strong enough to be here. And it would be kind of like, oh, we'll see you. Too bad. You're not good enough. And that really, that's hard. Hell yeah. You know, you struggle in silence and you don't want to quit, but you also want to quit because it's hard and no one's supporting you. But you're told if you quit, then you're a failure. And everyone else that stayed is better than you. And yep. that just compounded everything yep. for and, me, especially. Well, I think it would for anybody. I mean, that's the reality, Sinead. And I just want to take a quick second for people to really comprehend what you just said. Because on the show before, we've talked about toxicity within the police culture. And now we're talking about an operational communication center that you and your colleagues are feeling very much the same things as I am with mine out on the road or wherever, whatever we're doing the job. And that's a really shitty feeling is that you know you're struggling, but you best keep low about it because you're afraid of what will happen. I mean, that's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. It is. And I mentioned previously, like I've listened to all the episodes and that was something that really resonated and kind of was a thread throughout most of the episodes is the toxicity. And I'm really happy to say that it's changing. It's a slow process, but it's changing. And the people that are in management now in the OCC are very much on the side of mental health and keeping people healthy awesome. and supportive of time off and all that stuff. And it honestly makes a world of difference. Absolutely. To be able to go and talk to my manager and be like, hey, I'm not okay. I need some time off. 
and him being 110% supportive. He didn't guilt me for leaving, you know, my coworker short or anything like that. He, it was a take the time you need, tell me what you need, and I will do whatever I can to support you. And for me, that just, that made it so much easier to be off and take the time. And, you know, it's been, I've been off for almost two, well, two years almost, and just realized that I don't want to go back. And not because I don't love the job and I don't love the people. I just, it's time to move on. I'm in a space where I don't know if I could go back and use all the tools that I've gotten through, like my, I went through the OSI clinic, which if anyone has the opportunity, I would strongly recommend it is amazing. And I got so many tools from that. I don't know if in a space like that, I'd have the time to implement those tools after a call, especially I feel a lot of pressure being a senior operator. We're talking, there's watches that we work with that the most senior operators have six years. And I mean, that's a chunk of service, but it's not really like it's, it is, but it isn't. So there's always that pressure as a senior operator to kind of push through and be supportive. And, you know, I need to be okay because maybe someone else won't be, or I need to be okay because I can take the calls and make the files faster just based on my experience and longevity. And I'm like, I can't do that to myself again. I can't keep putting other people ahead of me when I come home and I'm not okay. And my husband sees it and my kids feel it. There just comes a point where you have to be selfish. And that is kind of where I was at. And I don't mean selfish in a negative way. I mean, selfish as in I gave my job everything for 16 years and it's time to look after myself. Absolutely. And I think too many times as well, Sinead, that we look at selfish as just naturally being a negative word. It's a negative term. It's got a negative connotation to it. And in reality, I mean, a big reason we get to where we are is because we have not been selfish enough. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And I think that's exactly it. I, I took a call right before I left of one of the detachment areas, and it was shots fired during a robbery. And wow. no one was hurt, thankfully. But it was a pretty heavy call because it could have turned out very differently. I got off the phone with the witnesses and the, the members were there and, you know, it was all good. And a newer operator kind of turns. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. It's good. And I just kept going. And then taking a step back, I was okay. But never in 15 years or 14 years, however long, has someone really taken the time to ask me if I was okay. I took a breath and I moved on and it was fine. But it showed me that the workplace is changing and that it's okay to not be okay. That being said, we're always told that you have time to walk away and take a breath and whatever you need to do. And I wholly support that for my fellow operators, that sometimes a call is just so terrible or so gut-wrenching that you need to step away. But I would never take that for myself because then I'm not there helping them with calls or helping them with other things. I am totally supportive and gung-ho, like, yeah, if you need it, take it. I will take your things. I will support you in any way I can. But the moment it was my turn to do those things or that I needed to do them, I never did it because I felt that I was letting my coworkers down and putting more work on them. Yep. I am right beside you. 100%. I mean, <laughs> I am dealing with that guilt to this day from when I walked away, stepped back, whatever you want to call in the first week of December, I am still, still struggling with that of the fact that I believe I left my tasks on my teammates who I love and it's tough, but in reality, I needed that time, and I think they also needed that time away from a person who was getting angrier, not nearly as patient as used to be, very stressed. And so it's tough. It's tough to be selfish. It is. Again, it's not a bad thing. You can't help other people if you're not in a place to be okay, because you do get impatient and angry and all this stuff. I remember vowing when I started as an operator, I was 22. I was excited. The world was my oyster. And there was some operators who had a ton of service. And I, I was working with these women. It was pre predominantly women then. And they would get so snappy on the phone with these clients. And I couldn't understand because I'm like, why? Like, why? And I vowed I would never become that operator that had no patience for anyone. Obviously, I understand more now where they were and why that was reactions to certain things. But at the time, I'm like, I'm never going to be that person. And, you know, I didn't think I was. And then there was another, an operator. He mentioned in passing, he goes, you know, you can really tell operators that have been here for a long time. 
And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, you guys look at this tone in your voice. It's like a, you don't put up with shit tone. I'm like, well, do you mean that in like a negative way? Like, do I make people feel invalid for why they're calling? He's like, well, it can sometimes be like negative, but you get this tone in your voice. And in my brain, I'm like, it's the tone. It's the seasoned operator tone. And he meant it as like a no bullshit, like, you kind of just do your job and move on. But for me, that really stuck with me because I'm like, if he's noticing that I'm getting this tone and he didn't mean it in a mean way, it was just a clear observation. I'm like, if he's noticing this, then how long have I been this way? And how many people have I spoken to in that tone that I vowed I would never have? And so that really, when I was deciding to medical out, that really played large in my decision. And I don't want to put it on him as one person, but having someone sit there and tell me that I hear in your voice that you have no patience and it's common among seasoned operators. I'm like, I can't treat people like that. I don't want to treat people like that. They're calling for help. I'm here to help them and get them help. And I can't be that person that makes them feel bad for calling the police in an emergency. So that really played in a part of deciding to take a medical. I get it. Absolutely. And the tone, it's funny. Because, I mean, the entire time you're talking about that, I'm just thinking about, oh, I bet I had a tone. <laughs> I bet I had a nasty-ass tone, there's no doubt. <laughs> yeah, shit. Janae, we're going to take a quick break here. Everyone stay tuned in to the podcast. When we come back, we're going to delve more into Sinead's journey, as well as how she is doing now that she only medically retired a month ago. Stay tuned. This episode of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is brought to you thanks to the support and financial sponsorship of Cracked Armor. Go to crackedarmor.com, read the story, buy the gear, wear it, to send a message to others who are struggling that they're not alone. Also, check out Willow Tree Farm, care of Jason Subkowich, another member who is struggling with PTSD and who frequently updates his Instagram to share his story. You can follow him at Jason. Subkowich. That's Jason. Dot Sierra Oscar Bravo Kilo Oscar Whiskey India Charlie Zulu. And we are back from the break once again with retired civilian RCMP member Sinead Holstein. Thank you, Sinead, so far for everything you've shared with the journey. It has certainly been quite introspective and resonating for me personally. There's no doubt it will be with others as well. Well, I hope so. I, you mentioned, like, as dispatchers, we're forgotten, and we accept that as the forgotten people. But I hope that it can reach other dispatchers to realize that if you hear things that are so traumatic and so hard, and there's not a lot of time to process it between calls, and, you know, you just kind of push through. But also, the job is so unique in the sense that as a police officer, you work in a detachment or an area and you can have a busy time and you can have three major things happen kind of in a row and you'll get help and you know you'll focus on those files. But because we cover so many detachments, we can have six or seven things happen like back to back to back and not just on the call side, but the dispatching side too. We can have pursuits and NBCs and shootings and all these things as well as all of the stuff, like the major calls that come in from different cities and different detachment areas. So instead of one detachment area that has a few things happen, we see it all. So every detachment that has anything, we're involved in. We have our hands in the pot. We're offering assistance. We're taking the calls. We're directing resources as requested. And it can be a lot because you see it all, you hear it all, and you deal with it. You have a hand in it. And whether it's your partner has a pursuit and you have to take their areas. So you're just a little bit more busy or you're on the phone because there's a suicidal person hanging onto a train. You have your hand in everything that passes through every detachment during your shift. Yep. That's right. And I mean, it's not only that as well. So I think just in terms of, you know, you getting those 1033 button pushes, that's got to all of a sudden change the reality for you guys as well. Uh, 1033s are loud. I don't know if you've ever been in an OCC when they come through. They should be loud, and I'm happy that they are, but definitely everything stops. When a 1033 comes in, everything stops. 
one person grabs the radio, tries to check in on the person, see what's going on. But everyone focuses on that, even while they're doing something else. It's definitely multitasking. You could be taking a call, but you're also listening to the dispatcher check on the 1033. Because if it's an actual 1033, then they need resources and it's going to be a lot of commotion and they're going to need support and you're going to need to support that operator the best that you can, however that looks like in the position you're doing that day. And luckily, most of them are accidental. But to say my heart stopped every single time is an understatement. Even after 16 years in the forest, the 1033 button, it stops my heart and my breath catches. But definitely, that's one of the hardest things to even think about. Like It kind of gets me worked up because my job is to protect the police officers. And that sounds so silly to say it out loud, but that's literally what we're told. Our job is to give all of the information to keep the public and the police safe and to do everything we can to make sure the officer goes home at night. So when that 1033 gets hit, it's just that kind of like, now I really have to make sure shit's going down and it can be really bad. And yeah, luckily most of them are just accidental, but sometimes they're not. And that's always really hard. The other one is when you open the radio or you open the, we call it open the repeater. It's not that anymore, but, and you hear sirens and that's all you hear and you know, something's going on. And sometimes the police officers don't answer you right away. And it just, that panic. I always told newer operators, I feel like a mother hen that's just trying to wrangle her chicks, that's trying to make sure everyone's okay and fed and safe. And they're going to wander out and do what they need to do. But my job is to keep track of them and make sure that they're equipped with what they need to make safe decisions and make sure that they all come home at night to the best of my ability. And that's, that's my job. And, you know, sometimes it's hard because it doesn't always work out the way that you hope. And you can only do so much from your chair but that's the job. Yeah. From, from my experience, and again, it was a different time of policing when I was doing what we call general duties in Canada, down the States or in some municipal areas, they often call it patrol working alone. You were my lifeline. We didn't have GPS and vehicles. We didn't have internet connections. We didn't have laptops in order to run our own queries. We were on a radio that was very finicky at times, especially if you were in some outer areas. And I remember if you took the right PC, you had access to a bag phone, a cell phone, which yeah, was a lot of dead areas for that as well. So OCC, the operator who was responsible for my detachment area, that was my lifeline. I didn't have backup. I didn't have other people to call. I couldn't just run queries on the side of the road. I couldn't learn that the individual I was dealing with had a warrant out for an aggravated assault and a homicide. It was completely dependent on you and your colleagues. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's also very stressful because ultimately on my shift, I was looking to take care of the general public, certainly people in my community, but otherwise me. And you're responsible for more than just you. And in a situation, a lot of times where you don't even put yourself in the equation, you don't even put yourself in the factor of anything, but yet you are also acquiring those scars, also acquiring those cuts. Again, there's no doubt that that has to accumulate over time. Well, it does. And it's funny you say that because never once would I ever, put, I'm safe. I'm in my chair. I am tied to my desk in a secure building with people around me that are there to help me and support me. I would never think of myself in those situations. My job is to keep other people safe because I'm, I don't want to say cushy because that's not necessarily the case. The chairs can be awful, but <laughs> I'm in a bubble. True. Yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in a bubble. I am physically safe. It never once occurred to me that I might not mentally or emotionally be safe because that is not relevant in what I'm trying to do in that moment. And it's funny. I also started when there wasn't, really GPS or anything like that. So I've done my career kind of evolving with that stuff. And it's been so exciting to see how technology can be so handy, yeah. especially for GD and stuff. It's great, but there's still a dead zone. And 
there's still all those things that we have to deal with, even with the new radio system. But it is what it is, right? And you just kind of manage around it. So it's not only helping the officers with the information, as you said, like the warrants or if they're a police hater or anything like that, that could be listed. It's also just knowing your officers and what regular speech is like. That sounds so obscure and out there. But an example is there was an officer that was by himself doing a traffic stop, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And I kept checking on him for a five minute timer because that's what you get when you're roadside. And he kept saying like, yeah, I'm fine. But his voice wasn't fine. He was out of breath. He was giving me short answers. It just seemed that something wasn't right to me. It didn't fit. So I ended up just calling back up for him because this isn't like he's an experienced officer. Why is he out of breath? So I got him some backup and it turns out he was fighting with two guys on the side of the road. And his reaction was to tell me he was okay because the other million times in his entire career when he's been checked on, he's been okay. And that's the reaction when in the fight or flight. And for me, it just, it didn't fit. And luckily his backup got there. And by the time the backup got there, he had the two guys under control and in the car. But, you know, it's not just giving the information so officers can make decisions on how to deal with situations. It's also just the nuances of everything because that can easily be overlooked. And sometimes that means that there's an injury or a casualty. And then you have to take that home with you. I shouldn't say you have to, but you do. If only I had. Jesus. And that's such a common phrase. And I think most first responders, if only I had done this differently, if only I had made this choice. And you sit in that and you feel that, but really there's nothing else you can do. You can't change it. You can't fix it. It is what it is. So that's that. It's amazing you tapped into that. I think that's absolutely amazing. Wow that you picked up on just the vocal nuances, some things that just seemed wrong, even though that individual was saying that uh, he or she was all right. I mean, that also, you know, let's bring that full circle and go, we're guilty of that pretty much every day when we struggle. Mm -hmm. We just fall back to, yeah, it's good. If someone just asks you, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I mean, that just seems to be the default reality that we don't, I don't know. We don't really, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Are we uncomfortable with saying that we're not okay? Have we just said we're okay so much that as you would mention, it's sort of just a natural auto response that that's what comes out is, yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. Sinead, the other thing that I want to touch on, and I, I really thought this was an absolute fantastic reality and concept that some people may not understand, but there's a lot of people out there who do is the lack of concern for physical safety doesn't necessarily mean there isn't serious concern and injury to your mental and emotional safety. Is that something you could potentially elaborate on? And the reason I say is that it's not uncommon, for example, for me to bump into members of the military who are struggling, but almost feel this sense of, embarrassment because they're struggling with things that have nothing to do with deployments as if you only get this because you were in the sandbox you were in bosnia you were in africa but that's not the case you don't have to be in a situation that you're going to endure physical stress injury grievous bodily harm whatever there's a lot more to that could you kind of, I guess, speak from the CM side of things? I can. I, you know, again, circling back to being told that because I'm not frontline in a physical sense, I wouldn't get PTSD. I wasn't allowed to have PTSD. And that's tough to be told that because there's a criteria, there's a monopoly on why someone can get something or why they react emotionally. It's basically your trauma isn't qualified because it doesn't fit this mold. And that's really a struggle, especially, I mean, I, I've been dealing with this and it's been, it's been tough, it's been a roller coaster. And it, it's so disconnecting because trying to explain to people, well, yeah, but I heard it. You know, I was on the phone with the kid who called me while his parents were 
having a domestic and I had to talk that kid through all that, that hurt. Like that leaves scars, that leaves mark. But I wasn't the one there breaking it up. And so it's almost like there's an entitlement to trauma. You're not entitled to be traumatized by this because you weren't in the military. You weren't, you know, doing those things. You didn't witness death of your troop mate. You, you don't, you're not entitled to that because you, what you suffered isn't as bad, in air quotes, as some other people. And so because someone's trauma absolutely could be worse than mine or what they've experienced could be gorier and more horrific than what I've experienced. That doesn't mean that I can't react the way I react. I react the way I react because of the situation I'm in. I can't compare myself or compare my trauma to a situation I'll never face or invalidate myself because I didn't do those other hard things. It doesn't make me feel less as far as trauma goes, but it definitely makes me feel, and you've mentioned in previous episodes of imposter syndrome, I feel like I'm faking it. I feel like this can't be happening because I don't fit the criteria. I don't fit the mold. I'm not the police officer scraping body parts off the pavement. I'm not that person. Therefore, I'm not entitled to feel the way I feel. And that can be really isolating and really tough because I'm not supposed to feel the way I feel. I'm not supposed to deal with the things that I deal with, but I am. And it just kind of undermines everything. And then to try and talk about it, it's almost, it's embarrassing because people have this idea of PTSD of being this big monster that you only get if something major and scary and awful happens. And it's usually one big thing. And that's not the case for me. So there's that embarrassment that, again, I'm not fitting the expectations or the definitions of what PTSD is supposed to look like and how that is. And that is a really easy way. And I'm sure that's how I went so many years not getting a diagnosis is just, I undermined myself every step of the way going, well, that's, that's normal. You know, it's normal to have nightmares in adults. It's normal that I lose my temper over the littlest things. It's normal that I prowl my house at night because I can't sleep. And I'm literally prowling to make sure that my space is safe from outsiders. That's all normal because I don't fit the mold. And hindsight, PTSD can be anything for anyone and look however many different ways. And that doesn't invalidate what you're going through as a person, as an operator, as a police officer or a soldier or a nurse or whomever falls under that. It doesn't invalidate that. Just because someone might have it worse doesn't mean you don't have it bad. And just to add on my two cents, which if you've heard of the podcast or the episodes before, this is not going to ring new to you, but... It can't be compared the end period. It just can't because your upbringing was completely different than mine. Where you were brought up was different than mine. Probably a lot of your cultures, a lot of things you saw, did, didn't do. They're all unique to each of us. And so you bring that with you when you go into the workplace. And whether you were on tour or not on tour in a war zone doesn't necessarily mean that you've seen the worst of things. I've spoken with people who were on tour and never saw a thing. It just was a quiet zone or they had an easier time. It was at a downtime. As Pat Gordon mentioned before, everyone knows there's a fighting season in Afghanistan, so it's off season. But I've also spoken to people before who never were on tour and they had some absolutely horrific things happen, including sexual assaults, physical assaults, harassment, bullying. You just can't say, well, I saw an IED go off. And so that's worse than being raped. How, how the fuck can you compare that? It's two totally, completely different experiences completely. And so it can't be compared. And likewise, yeah, I was out there and yeah, I might have had concerns for my physical safety. And it's very easy for someone like me to look at, well, Sinead, you in OCC and go, but what, what the hell were you afraid of? Like, what were you concerned about? 
But the reality is you are dealing with a lot of shit and it doesn't just come down ever to your physical safety. It very much, as you so beautifully stated, also comes down greatly to your emotional and your mental safety. And that's huge. And those scars are ones that very rarely heal as opposed to the things physically that can happen. I mean, that's the reality, people. So don't compare yourself. Don't compare your experiences. And I say that from experience as someone who also struggled big time with imposter syndrome. It's your trauma. It doesn't get compared. Your trauma is all of a sudden not a trauma because someone experienced something that seems more traumatic to you. It doesn't mean it's more traumatic. It's just your interpretation. Take a step back when you're thinking about those things. And when you sort of go, well, I'm interpreting it this way. Also accept that you do have a brain injury. And so your ways of interpreting things are not always going to be crystal clear. Don't compare yourself. And uh, I'm glad that you say that, Sinead. I'm really glad you say that. It's I think you've had a very, very difficult job. And I, for one, will always thank you for your service. Well, thank you. It's interesting because as a dispatcher, like I've had quite a few on-duty deaths while I've been in the OCC. And I make a point of trying to go to every single funeral. And it's tough because I know that I'm a part of the big red machine. But also I feel so much on the outside. So going... I had a member die in 2009 in a collision, and I dealt with the entire thing on the radio. And I was actually the last person to speak with him before he died in the collision. And I remember going to the funeral and sitting at the front, and I was crying. I was upset. It was hard. I was two years in. Like it was just, it was, it was tough. And I remember thinking to myself, like, from the outside, I must look like the most random person just crying in the front of this regimental funeral for someone and no one knows me. And I couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable going up to members and being like, Hey, I'm from the OCC because I always felt like a groupie doing that. It's such a strange thing. So while I feel, and I think most operators will say this, while I feel like a part of the family and most officers are really good at being inclusive and being like, yeah, totally. Like you said, you're the voice, you're the lifeline and kind of welcoming there's others that just don't want to have anything to do with us outside of like run my car run my guy and we definitely put so much of ourselves in the job to make sure that everyone's safe and it's not about acknowledgement but it's just such a precarious place to be in because you don't feel like you fit in any place you're not a police officer but you're not necessarily like a a public person like not a member And it's just such an interesting and hard place to be. For me, just kind of circle back, the big eye-opener for me is, as far as my brain injury and and my PTSD goes, is I got a letter from VAC. uh, Being a civilian member, I, I can apply for VAC. And I got awarded. I got a positive whatever. I don't even know what it's called. I got awarded whatever, and they had assessed my file, which my psychologist wrote up, and it ended up being like 32 pages or something absurd. And VAC deemed me 49% disabled based on what they read. Wow. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how am I, and I rounded up, but like, how am I 50% mentally disabled based on this government agency who assesses hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people? How can they sit there and deem me that when I don't feel like that, like, and that was really, there was such a disconnect from what I read and what I was assessed by these professionals and how I felt. And again, the imposter, I, why would I be 49% disabled? Like, I'm not entitled to that. I am not, I didn't earn that, so to speak, which is such a silly thing to say and how to put it, but that's how it felt. I didn't earn my disability because I wasn't frontline face to face with all this stuff. Sinead, Mm -hmm. every single, and just please hear me out as an experienced member and far from young, every single scar that you bear, you've earned. 
and that's where I'm at. I'm embracing it. I'm embracing retirement. I'm not even 40 yet. So the fact that I can say I'm retired and the, I have choices, I can do what I want. One of the things that was really tough as an operator is we were always told that you're specialized. You're specialized. You can't go anywhere else. There's no other jobs in the force that fit your qualifications and your skills. And the first half of my career, that was meant almost as like a negative. You can only do this job and that's it. And then kind of as I got older and as the workplace changed for more positive, that became more of a like, you're specialized, you're highly trained and highly experienced. And I began to embrace that in the sense that we are those things. And yes, we can't just transfer from unit to unit to unit because there is no other unit that does that what we do necessarily. It became a point of pride to be able to say, like, I did that. I worked through all these things and I'm trained and I can crisis negotiation, crisis communication, suicide intervention. Like those are things that we do on such a regular basis on top of managing a bunch of people and their time and their places and making sure that information is accurate and up to date on everything. Being able to do those things in a timely manner, that's an accomplishment. And I think that's something that operators need to remember is you are specialized and unique and not in a negative way. You may not be able to transfer from one unit to another, depending on how the agency is, but you're special and unique and not everyone can do that job. Absolutely. That's a specialty. And there's a lot of people that can't do that job. And that's what you need to make sure you remind yourself of, that it's not a job for everybody at all. The other thing as well, and I do recall that 2009 incident, I was just in between transferring out of K division for a promotion. And I remember, and as tough as it is, think about the number of members that made it home after shift because of you. Thousands. You're no imposter. You are no imposter, (laughs) Sinead. I really appreciate you joining the podcast. I can't believe how fast the time has gone, although I'm not surprised. I knew when we spoke a couple of weeks ago that this was going to fly. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Whatever it is, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to share, get off your chest, whatever. This is your time. You have the floor. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of pressure. Um, I would just say specifically, well, to new members coming in, go and sit in your OCC, go and be kind to them because they're the ones that are there for you no matter what. But also if you're by yourself in the middle of nowhere and you're new and you don't know anything, the amount of knowledge that sits in an OCC is outstanding. I may not know it as your operator, but there's, seven or eight other people in the room that might and we're resources use us for new operators i would say it's okay to not be okay and there's no one definition or one criteria that makes you worthy for lack of a better term of trauma and ptsd and if you are feeling not okay talk to someone because if you sweep it under the rug larry as you've said before it's only going to get worse and once it's to a point it's a lot of work to kind of get back to who you used to be and it's worth it to do the work. But if you don't have to put two years into an OSI clinic, then I would say just talk to someone. There's tons of resources I can speak with from within the RCMP. There's tons and tons and tons of support and outside the RCMP. So you're allowed to not be okay. Sinead, I really appreciate your time to everyone else who's listening. If you are considering being a dispatcher, Fantastic. You are a specialist, as Sinead said. You are desperately needed, but understand that you will experience trauma. And that's okay, too. The key is to talk about it early, to talk about it from day one. Even if on that first day, all you got were barking dog complaints, start talking, start establishing trust with someone with a therapist, establish trust with people who are in your circle, others who you know have experience, just start establishing your net of resources. For those who are police officers or in any of the first responder world occupations, military, 
whoever has had the opportunities to deal with a civilian member that's in an operational communication center, you need to thank them. You need to actually step back and realize what these members have done. And I say members because they're members, what they have done, what they have sacrificed, what they have given. So if you're still on the job, sometime today when they're doing a quick check on you to make sure you're good, thank them. Just say thanks. If you're done the job, reach back to anyone you know. Do a damn Facebook post or an Instagram post or whatever. Just admitting, you know, damn, I didn't realize how much these men and women did at an OCC for me and for my brothers and sisters. And they too are my brothers and sisters. It's not just you that got your ass home at the end of every shift. My name is Larry Payton. I have your six. Please have mine. Don't go away. There's so much left to do. So many things I want to say. And I sing Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away.